Have you ever dreamed of being an entrepreneur? Well, who hasn't? But what keeps us from that dream? How about for starters, the willingness to try and the confidence to succeed? Let's have ourselves a pocket-sized pep talk because maybe it's selling magazine subscriptions in the fourth grade, or maybe it's founding your own company, which you eventually sell to a Fortune 500 company, all of which my guest today accomplished. You up for some lessons from a serial entrepreneur and a salesman? Good. Stay tuned. A pocket-sized pep talk, the podcast that can help energize your business and your life with a quick, inspiring message. Now, here's your host, Rob Jollis. Today's guest, Jim Packard, has been an entrepreneur his entire life and is the poster child for a life of consistent action. From turning a $500 investment into a $17 million a year business, he excelled every day, all day, for years. He shepherded inventions through development and appeared on QVC over 25 times. Through that venue alone, he sold over a million dollars of a single product, found success as an inventor, speaker, author, and network marketer. He's the co-author of The Consistency Chain for Network Marketing. Happy to have you with us, Jim, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Rob. I'm pleased to be here. Well, you bet. A pleasure to have you here, and I want to dive right in. I I had to leave out some of that bio, but to me, it's a fascinating one. So let's start here. What age did you realize the career path that you decided upon? And it's been an interesting one. I I, early on in the uh, in my elementary school days. They had a contest for the fourth and fifth graders at Lincoln Elementary School who could sell the most subscriptions, could pick their whatever they wanted for a gift. And they had a whole room full of big gifts. Well, I was in the fourth grade. I saw this white pearl handled knife with a leather case and I wanted that. I went out. I won the contest. I won. I picked out the knife. Can you imagine giving a knife away in in school today? Those were the days, yeah. Oh, my God. Well, on the way home, I cut my finger. The bus driver took my knife away, and he wrapped (laughs) my finger with a handkerchief. And that was, but, you know, I was bleeding from it. But at the same time, I go, you know, that was pretty easy selling those things. So, uh, and and then I think when junior high school, I was a newspaper carrier for the Miami News. Right. And they had a contest where the first three people that sold the most subscriptions got to go to the Seattle's World Fair. Ooh. And number four through 60 got to go to uh, get on a train and go to Washington, D.C. and then up to New York. But what the powers to be didn't know is that I was a gigantic New York Yankee fan and I wanted to go to New York and see the Yankees play. And I worked my butt off for six weeks. And uh, now I didn't finish four through 60, so I didn't win that trip. But I did finish first and got the trip to the Seattle's World Fair, which I then traded with the guy that came in fourth. And I was on that train to see the Yankees. Outstanding. <laughs> that's that's hysterical. And, you know, our paths are similar in a, in a way. I, uh, I got into a contest early on. It was, believe it or not, it was a case of tennis balls to name a high school that was just opening. And I thought, well, if I can name this thing, someday maybe – Years down the road, they'll invite me back as the guy who named them. So and it was Wooten High School in Potomac, Maryland. Uh, uh, but I immediately started looking at those tennis balls and started creating award levels of who was going to get a single tennis ball out of that box of probably 100 of them. And uh, kind of pulled, pulled this idea together and ended up naming them the Wooten Patriots. What did I think of the Patriots? Didn't know, didn't care. Just was a name. I just wanted to win that contest. But I also delivered papers like you. Uh, I never came in first, so, so you got me beat. But I, I I picked up some watches and some other things. In any case, it's it's clear that you're obviously a serial salesperson. And I want to, can we take throw one other idea out, an idea? I want people to hear this. You know, uh, I run a podcast. I get uh, people that will want to be on I get at least one pitch a day, every day of the week, all the time. But you're listening to an entrepreneur that we're talking to right now. Jim, what did you send me in a box? Do you remember where I sent you an email? I said, oh, what is this? What did you send me in the mail? 
I sent you a beautiful custom made greeting card with a box of brownies. Absolutely. And instruction. Well, actually, I was all ready to, to warm them up. But uh, the moment I sent a thank you to Jim, he said, and you got to warm them up. <laughs> he was explaining <laughs> to me. Well, another thing we but I, I got to tell you, how many times in my career have I had somebody send me brownies? That's easy to count. How about never? And how about the creativity of something like that? So that's how sometimes we get a conversation going. Uh, that's, the, that's not what booked Jim today. But what, what that did was started a conversation. And then I got to meet the individual, and then we take it home from there. So you know, believe me, this guy puts his money where his mouth is. I never saw anything like that, and I want to congratulate you. Anyway, it wasn't just the brownies. You're a bright guy, but that opened the door. And how many salespeople are looking to open the door? So, Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, let's stay there. Um, you, Despite all the success, you struggled with a classic sales question. We all struggle with one, by the way. Why can't I get people to do what I do? And that led you into some fundamental differences in the way people are wired. I want you to talk to that a little bit. You created the Consistency Chain Project. Tell me about you know, it. You know, that was a, um, I got into network marketing and I was building a team and, and I met a gentleman that is a, a great speaker. And he always wondered why he could be successful in one thing and not in another. And it got me thinking is, I hadn't given it to a whole lot of thought that why don't people do what I do and they'll be successful. But he got me thinking about that. And we did a lot of research and people just aren't wired the same. They're wired differently. Some people are wired for instant gratification, and some people have the ability to delay that gratification. And if you eliminate all the things they have in common, like ambition and, and sales training and, and, and what have you, and you take those out of the scenario, what's the difference? And the difference is the people that are consistent are the people that get it done. And what makes them consistent? What you know, and that's what the whole book is about. Is it's really a it's a goal setting strategy for those people that have a hard time sticking to a goal or sticking to a plan, I should say. So I look at people and wonder why they, you know, may, why they weren't successful. And I would think, well, it's, they didn't have the big enough why, or the why that made them cry. And I and it I couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, that, that's just not the case. And like I said, it's just because. Some people, you know, from early on, I mean, like five years old on, they're just not wired for that consistency. And it's a, and, and in our book, we share a concept where you can have that consistency. If you're part of that 80% that doesn't have it, there is a way to develop that consistency. And that's what the book is about. Right. It, I'm, what I'm trying to nail down here is where does process play a part in all this? For instance, at Xerox, you know, my boy, this is a, it's like a mantra. I bet the, I've said this on over a hundred podcasts, but we, the mantra was we're always searching for repeatable, predictable steps. And, and it, you can't always accomplish that, by the way, but some way of measuring what we're doing so we can achieve consistency. So I'm, I'm looking for you, you know, is there a process to consistency? How about that as a question? I'm not sure, it. but as you know, I was in the copier business also. Yeah, yeah. And we used to call you guys Brand X. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we admired you people, that's for sure, and the processes and the PSI school that you had to develop all the people. I don't know if there's a, if we have the, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um uh, we don't have the patience to develop the 80 percenters that are sitting in that audience. We certainly have the 20 percenters and we can give them a list of things to do and they'll do them. Just get it out of their way. But you, you really have to appeal to that, that 20, at least 20 percent of that 80 percent to have them become successful. Yeah. And I agree with you. I, I coach basketball and um, I always felt like, look, my best guy is going to cover your best guy. <laughs> um, and my my middle group will do okay. It's how I'm developing sort of the middle to the bottom end. And if I can develop that group, uh, you don't have anybody to cover them. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and that's the way as a manager, it's the same thing. We all have a couple of superstars, but well, now we're okay. already, so do they. 
you know, well, you, you know um, it's, it's interesting. I'm a big basketball fan as well. So we have that in common too. I didn't even know that. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm my my bracket is doing okay right now. By the time this comes have, out, my bracket Purdue. will be over. <laughs> uh, I'm in what's called the Ricky Bobby bracket. If you ain't first, you're last. That's the <laughs> motto of our bracket. But like I said, by the time this this plays, uh, Rob will either have won or lost his bracket. Uh, all right, let's let's keep going. You're an inventor, and um, I'm told that just about everyone in your audience uses a variation of the product that you invented. All right, drum roll. What's the product? I'll, sh I'll show it to you. How's that? Well, uh, I'm going to have to describe it because a lot of people won't be able to see it. Oh, my goodness. He is showing me something that I have in my hand. Okay. Oh, my uh, gosh. You have the same one. I have this cup. All right. So what Jim is showing us is a lid. Uh, at least this is what mine is. It's a lid for a sort of a cup thermos yeah. um, that um, keeps, I mean, objects warm, has a little slit in it so we can drink out of it and keep our cup warm. You are the inventor of that. Is that my, the story? My dad and I both are the inventors of this. And the way that came about, I was out making sales calls mm -hmm. with a salesperson. There you go. And we stopped at McDonald's. And I got a cup of coffee and I ripped off the, you know, a portion of it so I could drink it. And of course, I spilled it on myself. And I got home that night and I said to my wife, Sherry, we've been married 53 years, by the way. So, and I said to her, I said, I'm going to invent a coffee cover lid that you don't have to tear it apart just to drink it. Right. That night, I got a call from my father. You talk about divine intervention. And he says, Jim, I need to borrow some money. That's a typical conversation that we had. <laughs> and I said, why? And he says, I've got an invention I want to develop. And I go, what is it? And I, I said, because I just came up with one today, Dad. And he says, well, what's yours? You tell me yours first. So I told him. And there was silence at the other end of the phone. He says, that's the exact same thing that I came up with today. And that's how we developed it. And I have the patent on my wall. Oh, uh, yeah. I uh, mine is uh, it's does yours twist on? So no, this was the very basic one. This was back in the early seventies when we came up with this, and it's it's just a just a cover with a hole in it so you can drink out of it. And back yeah. in those days, they didn't have anything that you can. They had covers, but nothing with a hole in it or I anything. See. I see. Well, uh, true to your word, <laughs> I'm I'm looking at him saying everyone in the audience has used a variation of this. Man holds it up. I'm in the middle of having a cup of hot tea with his lid on it. So, uh, <laughs> so you win that round again. All right. Uh, I, I, I tell you, you are a character. I feel like this is um, almost like a game show at this point. So here's the, here's your next question for 25 points. Okay. You invented a product that has appeared on QVC over 25 times. Is it the lid or is there something else now? No, something else. Okay. And I will show you what that is again. And I will describe so you can't it. See it, but here it is. Okay. And, what and now it's at... just it's, it's got two little springs. Okay. You got to describe that to the audience here. I don't it's, even know how to describe what I'm looking at. It's a plastic device that sits on your desk. Uh huh. And it holds a cord of a mouse so that when you use the mouse, the nice. the cord doesn't get hung up on your desk. So well, it looks like this. All right. So, okay. All, All right. right. Uh, we, when did uh, you sell? When were you selling that one? Oh, gosh. 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing with a lot of um, mice now uh, becoming Bluetooth, the, the demand has gone down slightly for that one. Yes. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about it, though, over 80% of all the mice in the world have a cord. All the third world countries have it. All the military installations have it because they can't have. They don't want that lag time that happens between a, you know, a cordless and a and a, and a corded mouse. Okay. So we went on QVC, mm -hmm. and it was it was difficult to get on. They only take three products out of every hundred. So when we we got on, um, I had to go down for training. This is a funny story. 
and they they put you through these classes because certain things that you can say on air and the certain things you can't say on air and stuff like that. And of course, the whole town knew that I was going to be on because I told everybody I was going to be on at one o'clock on Saturday. Tune in, blah blah blah, and and uh, I get down there and I go through the class, and then it's and this this is on Friday, and on Saturday I. I, you know, I or Friday night, I said to the my agent, I said, well, I'll see you tomorrow morning. It's uh, I'll be here early. I'll be here around seven or eight. And he goes, is it, you don't need to be here that early because you only get eight minutes on the show. And I said, well, I want to be here for the whole thing. Well, little did I know I was on at one o'clock in the morning. Oh, my goodness. All right. Because that's when all the techies are on. Right. That's all the people that stay up late at night. And I remember. We the guy just before me was selling Tona cartridges. He'd love this, right? And he sold twelve thousand dollars worth of Tona cartridges. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if we could just sell twelve thousand dollars worth of now we call this the mouse bungee. That's what we called it. Okay. And and by the way, I was the big the big cheese of the company. Yep. Okay. And that was my title. And when we went on, we sold two hundred and forty two thousand dollars in eight minutes at one o'clock in the morning. Wow. We were the absolute talk of the show. And um, we went on probably 25 times uh, oh, selling that incredible. product. Yeah. Well, that'll get you on 25 times for sure. And for those who are trying to visualize this, if you know anybody who actually, and I'm going to just come from a different angle, if you know anybody who has a CPAP, a lot of times those <laughs> those cords that go to the CPAP, the, the, the tube gets pulled. And so there are devices that actually will hold them up a little bit, suspend them. So it so it pulls a little easier. What Jim is showing me and what he's just what he invented is something that does that on a very small scale. He's sort of holding up that uh, mouse cord, uh, and then um, there's some spring to it. That's incredible. Uh, well, uh, it's actually on my bucket list. Uh, we may have to talk about this. Always wanted to get my eight minutes on QVC. Uh, <laughs> I will tell you this, and then we'll move off this real fast. I um, actually met with QVC. In the late 80s, if you can believe that, uh, they came to Xerox and it was my account. They wanted to learn. They wanted to hear how Xerox sold and see if we could work with their on-air personalities. But Jim, I did. I, I lost the account because I just couldn't abide by what they wanted. They just kept hammering me about we want to we want to learn features and benefits, features and benefits, features and benefits. And I kept saying, No, you don't. You got. You want to learn how to how to take that small problem that somebody's living with who's watching the television and, and make it a bigger problem or show them the repercussions of it potentially becoming a bigger problem. And they went, no, features and benefits. And I was sort of stuck in my ways. And I was a young guy and I'm, you know, a little bit of a punk. And I went, well, then I'm not the guy for you. And uh, we didn't work with them. But just because well, of know, my stuff. They own, they own the old Commodore factory uh, Do they? Outside, yeah, in, in, in Pennsylvania. And if you went on, if I went on as the president of the company, I would get eight minutes. But if I didn't go down and drive down and go on on live, you'd only get four minutes. But I remember one day we were there, they did $82 million in sales in one day. Wow. And this was over 10 years ago now. Mm. Think about it. I don't know what they do now. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. What they I do. probably should have worked with him because then I could have said, well, see, Jim, see what happens when you work with Rob Jollis. <laughs> now, I, now the story goes, see what happens when you don't work with Rob Jollis. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. All right. Let's uh, you, you, uh, you and I know that we have a lot of things in common here other than the love of brownies. Yeah. Uh, I've had Jay Abraham on my show. Uh, and it turns out that Jay played a role with you in your business. Tell me about that. Yeah, he was. He had a contest where he was looking for the top thirty items in the United States that were unique, and he actually picked this product, which is the mouse bungee. And this it was it made the top thirty. And he invited me out to California. I got to spend a week with him, learning about you know how he markets. And I mean, he's brilliant. I mean, he's I I utilize about one percent of the things that he does, but. He will tell you that there's only three ways to grow a business. Number one, get more customers. That's pretty obvious. Number two, get them to buy more things when they're inside your business. Okay. And number three, to get them to come back more often. Now, if you're McDonald's and have unlimited budgets, 
I mean, if you want more customers, just build another location or just advertise more. If you want to increase the size of the the the, the order that that they're buying when they're inside your store, ask them a phrase like, "Do you want fries with that hamburger?" In fact, that increased their profits uh, by thirty five percent. I found out. Or if you want them to come back more often, offer different selections like salads or like ice cream. And if you remember when we were growing up, the only thing they offered was hamburgers. They didn't have breakfast when they started ordering breakfast and then, then they started going with salads at night. So he, and now I don't have the budget of McDonald's. So he said, you got to get creative. And I started looking around and I said, what are people doing that are creative in their marketing? And I had one person that, I mean, there's a rep up in Flagstaff here that every Thursday morning from nine to nine, nine to 1030, he buys anybody a coffee that comes in. That's his way of prospecting. There's a company in Maine called Catch a Piece of Maine that they rent you a lobster trap and anything they catch in it is yours. And you can just rent the, the traps from them. Well, the thing that hit home most was that he, he, he his philosophy, if you can look at an industry and see what makes that industry successful and take that idea and apply it to your industry, what might be as common as dirt in one might have the effect of an atomic bomb going off in another. And that's where I came up with the idea because we went, uh, when we were growing our, our copier company, uh, we had a trip and it was a trip to uh, the Bahamas and it was a sandals resort. Now at a sandals resort, they're all inclusive. You, you walk in, you put your wallet in the safe and you close it and everything's on the house. And I'm thinking, what a great concept that is. I mean, no matter when an employee comes up next to you and you can buy him a drink, I mean, because it's all on the house. So I said, wouldn't it be great if we had a, an, a, if we could do that with our copiers? So when I got back home, you know, back in the days, you sold the copier, you sold the maintenance contract, you sold the service contract, you know how that goes, yep. right? I'm thinking, what if I just go and, and offer a cost per copy program? Why don't I just go, Rob, if you want a copier, here it is. I'll just set it right here. I'll charge you a nickel a copy and I will pay for the supplies, uh, do all the service for free. You don't have to pay for the copier. It's all part of the program. And we started doing that and our competition didn't have a clue what we were doing. And they didn't catch on probably for a couple of years that we had a cost per copy program that really, I think it, it was a reason why we got, we had such a large market share in the state. Wow. Have you always been this creative? I mean, were you, were you born this way? No, it's <laughs> just hard work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do well, a lot of reading. Impressive. Yeah. No, and I mean, that's impressive because I'm sure people are listening right now going, well, that guy probably two years old was trying to figure out a better, better kind of rattle. But no, um, you're sort of a guy that you look like a guy and just getting to know you and um, and having the conversations before we went on the air and sort of over the past couple of weeks. Uh, and I, I hope you take this as a compliment. Uh, you're a grinder. You're, 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 yeah, like I a am guy. a grinder. I'll yeah. Give you that. Yeah. You know, funny thing, you listen to golfers, they'll shoot really good rounds. They'll just tell you, I had to work for every shot. You know, it, it was not an easy round of golf, but I think you'll like the scorecard. Um, okay. That's what a grinder does. Well, you know, with, with, um, if you think about it, the springs on, on the mouse bungee, mm -hmm. you know where that concept came from? No, I'll show you. All right, he's going to show me, and I'm going to describe it. I have to keep reminding you. People get oh, okay. He's now showing me. Looks like an iron from the 1940s. I <laughs> That's mean, right. I mean, steel iron, like you see in a Three Stooges movie. But what he's showing me, and it's interesting, is where the cord is connecting to the iron. A big spring. Keep it from. I, I'm to keep it from getting under that iron. I'm assuming. And burning that that wire up, keep it extended away from the iron. Correct. Yeah, that's what your mother used when you were growing up, and took that concept, and that's what the mouse bungee was developed after. Wow! Wow! See, ideas all around us. All right, got another one for you. You take a five hundred dollar investment, and here comes Houdini, 
and you turn that, grow that into a a seventeen million dollar business that you sold. Tell me about that. Tell me about that one. Now that was dumb luck, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because I started off with just me, and then mm-hmm. I brought in two people to work with me. We all put in five hundred dollars and had a dream, and we had two t- we had two salespeople basically that could sell and one technician. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, what do we do with the technician? We don't have a lot of copiers that he can go out and service or fix, right? Ronnie was a great, the, the guy that we hired was a great technician. By the way, he was with me when we sold the company, whatever it was, 27 years later. But I said, what do we do with Ronnie all day long? Because he's not good at selling. And I remember my dad used to work for Western and Southern Life Insurance Company. And he had to visit every single account every single month and collect a debit. And, and that's how they did their business. And I said, well, why don't we just have Ronnie go to these accounts and we'll over-service them? I mean, we had fierce competition. I mean, this was one way that I looked at it. And I said, well, if we just service the accounts that we have and over-service them, uh, when we won't give the customers a reason to leave us. It won't, they won't leave us on price. They won't leave us on, you know, if they have that good a service. So we came up with an idea where he would just start visiting accounts. And we, you know, that was dumb luck because what I didn't realize at the time was that the lifetime value of a customer is sometimes in excess of 10 times the original purchase price. Now think about it, all right? If you have a customer and you keep them, he's going to, the dividends are going to come tenfold for you. Hey, Jim, I'm su- I'm surprised it's that low, but keep going. Yeah. Well, that, that's why I use yeah. tenfold. But right, but and also, those customers have a seventy percent better uh, opportunity to sell those customers than to go out and find a new one. Now, forget about the referrals that you can get from customers. If you're over servicing, right, you're not going to lose those referrals either, and. When we sold the company, this was like 27 years later, we were doing 122 hours of courtesy calls on our present customers. That's why we grew so large. That's why I, I really, I have not, I cannot think of a single major account that we ever lost mm. that we had because of the servicing that we did. And, and that came from started out with dumb luck, you know, what to do with Ronnie, and to, it made me look like a marketing genius, because we had a 40% market share in the state of Maine and New Hampshire, when we sold the company. And was it a copier company? What, what company was yeah, it? Yeah, it was a copier company okay. called American Business Systems. We wanted American in there to get in the phone book first, because we we're the largest advertiser in the phone book. And, right. and, uh, and by the way, when Xerox came out with their agent program, yeah, we were in one of the top twenty agents that they had in the country. They came to us first. Because Did you ever get to uh, Leesburg for the? Agent I never training? got to Leesburg. I, I they sent me to the PSI training school. Yes, yes, yeah, professional PSS, selling so skills. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, they they sent me up to that school in Toronto, and I actually finished first in the school, so that was pretty cool. What, but, what a shock! Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I will. I am asking because one of my projects at Xerox back in the eighties was. I was the uh, original trainer that worked for the agent program. And oh, so isn't we that had, interesting? Absolutely. And by the way, we didn't teach PSS to the agents, nor did we teach SPIN, which was an internal product. We right. created something called Buyer Focus Selling. And um, that was a project that that I worked on. And um, uh, it was one of the my one of the greatest projects I ever got to work on with Xerox was working with the agents because they were all like you, super nice people. <laughs> From yeah. smaller towns, uh, yeah. and um, and incredibly loyal to Xerox, and uh, it was a win-win. And for the and just to catch up this audience right now, the agent what Xerox realized was in some of these areas where they really weren't getting our reps, where they were undercovered, um, they were just we just weren't there enough. Uh, we were losing market share, so Xerox decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to create agencies that will be authorized to sell Xerox equipment. Uh, and and, um, and you we're kept the service. Them. You kept yeah. the service, which right. was really right. the 
the most important part. Yes. <laughs> we were yeah. just little worker bees out there selling the, the boxes. Yeah, but you had exclusive rights on those boxes. Yes, we did. You yes, we did. Wouldn't put another one across the street from you. No, nope, no. Nope. Uh, uh, so I met with agencies for years at Xerox. And, um, you know, anyway, it was just really interesting. Well, so one I, of the I, things I, we did one. to set ourselves apart back in those days is that we started sending greeting cards to the copiers on their birthdays, on their anniversaries. Right. And because great. we couldn't, in the state of Maine, I couldn't go out and visit every single account. You know, our salesperson couldn't do it. It was too much driving time. So we came, we were trying to think of ways that we could, you know, have communication with them. And, and I always remembered that, you know, I mean, you couldn't find good greeting cards for, you know, customized greeting cards other than happy birthday or something, or, you know, thanks for the referral. So that's what led me to the, into the greeting card business eventually. Unbelievable. And I want to tell you, I spent years with Xerox, uh, I bleed blue X's. I've never heard of anybody ever doing that before. And why the heck not? What a yeah. what a simple, brilliant idea. Can you imagine sitting there and all of a sudden oh. across your desk, you got an envelope and you open it up and it says, happy birthday. Yeah. And you go, it's not my birthday. And you open it up and you said, dear Mr. Copier, it's your third year birthday right now. You might <laughs> want to think about changing us. OK. In the future. And, and we did. We played on those type of things. So brilliant. All right. I got one more question for you. I'm holding my breath on this one. But <laughs> my question is. Other businesses that you've been involved in that played uh, into the success, the success you've enjoyed. Yeah, well, it's it's uh, it's interesting. When I moved to Arizona, I I realized that I didn't play golf well enough that I even wanted to play every single day. Mm -hmm. So I said, "What was I good at? I was good at customer retention." Mm -hmm. I look at different businesses. I don't care if it's the pool business or if you're in landscaping or roofing or what it might be, we work so hard to find a customer. How much time and effort are you spending on retaining the customer? So I got into the greeting card business and the greeting card that I sent you with the brownies was part of that. Yep. yep. Right? And I, I don't do a lot of advertising. In fact, I don't do any advertising. It's kind of word by word of mouth, but I have a greeting card service that I will send out greeting cards on your behalf, or you can do it on your own. I don't care which, so that you don't lose a customer. And I've been doing that for, oh gosh, since I moved here to Arizona in 2002. Wow. And the interesting thing about that is I took the same concept originally, you know, how can you make your greeting card stand out? So I thought back to Jay Abraham again, right? Look at other industries. What are they doing? Uh, be creative. So this is what my greeting cards look like. It's a regular right, greeting he's card. He's now showing me a card with a baseball on it. I'm not sure. Okay. It says Babe Ruth struck out more times than he hit home runs. Okay. And you open it up, and what do you see? I see another baseball. Read that one to me. I'm hard, I'm in trouble seeing it okay. on the screen. You see the oh, but I see I see inside. a little envelope with a piece of paper in it. So you're opening up his card, and in the card is another em small envelope with a little card in it. He's taking the card out, and what does it say? We're looking forward to our next at bat. Yep. <laughs> Although, you know, and this concept came from the Cracker Jack. Oh, box. yeah. He's, he's showing up. Inside. Now he's showing me a box of Cracker Jacks. He's a very visual person, folks. <laughs> I'll, I'll narrate the best I can. Uh, so, uh, by, so, by the way, Cracker Jacks, in my opinion, one of the most mismanaged products on the face of this earth. Because if I got into the Wayback Machine, I would, you, you're targeting certain things. I would target that particular product and say, who else is competing against Cracker Jacks? Why are they still locked in the 1950s? You heard me, Cracker Jacks. And they're owned by, is it Beverly? Who owns, who owns Cracker Jacks? I'm not sure who they're owned by. I don't know if it says on the box, but... So I uh, that that's why I came up with the concept and yep. and later on I found out that it was really interesting uh, how I got into network marketing. Yeah, I was uh, it was uh, I had one of, I was working when I got out of college I went to work for G Fox and Company big retail store in Hartford Connecticut five thousand employees 
you know, had guys with white gloves open up the elevators and all that stuff for the patrons. And they had a contest for Bermuda and the department that had the highest percentage got the trip and I won the trip. And, and I got, and I got home from the trip and it was a letter in the mail. And in the letter, it says, dear Jim, your name has come to our attention as the type of person that we're looking for to, uh, who possesses the qualities that we're looking for. We'd love to have you and your wife come down and discuss your future. And I'm thinking, yes, yeah, somebody heard about the contest. I just won. Well, we get there. It's a network marketing presentation at the Holiday Inn in Hartford, Connecticut, right? Yeah. And we answered the call. A thousand letters were sent out. I was the only person to respond. That's how I got into network marketing for $3,200 at the time. Wow. But it was the best $3,200 I ever spent. I'll bet so. Because of the education that I got with it. So, Well, he is the author of The Consistency Chain for Network Marketing. You can certainly see that he knows a thing or two about networking. Uh, tell me about, uh, real fast, I, I, a lot of times I'll ask about a mentor, but I know that you have a, a, a co-author and a partner. Give me 20 seconds on him. Yeah, remarkable guy. He's uh stand-up comic for 10 years with Jerry Seinfeld and that whole group that came up together. For 20 years, he toured the country as Joe Malarkey, America's worst motivational speaker. And that landed him into the Speaker's Hall of Fame. He's really a brilliant guy. And he and I partnered up about six or seven years ago, wrote the Consistency Chain book. We have the Consistency Chain and the Consistency Chain for Network Marketing. And we just speak to organizations that... Uh, that want to affect their bottom line. So that's outstanding. 20 seconds or less. Yeah, and a, a great job. But I want to tell you something. And I'm and I want I want you to hear this. I uh, you know, I, I've never booked a guy because I liked the brownies he sent in the mail before, but I was I, in a sense it inspired me. Uh, and I went with a hunch with you, Jim. And I'm gonna tell you, I have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation with you. I think you're a brilliant marketer. Uh, your 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 mind is like a popcorn machine; it just keeps popping, uh, and it's just um, it's delightful. And I really appreciate the fact I I'm t I've got about a page of notes that I've taken on this conversation uh, that have spurred me on some ideas that um, I don't think I'd have found without this conversation. So um, kudos to you, sir. Uh, truly, how do people get a hold of you? Um, they can just write to me on email, jim at jimpacker.com. Okay. That's, I Simple mean, as that. And yeah. we, uh, outstanding. Okay. And uh, and uh, and take a look at his book too. It's on Amazon. Uh, yeah. You could and you know pick it up. It's a, it's an easy read. Jim was kind enough to send me a copy. I usually tell my authors, please don't send me a copy, but he sent me a copy anyway. So I have been I have been <laughs> browsing through it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, obviously, as you can tell, this guy doesn't take no for an answer real well. So, uh, but anyway, thanks for, thanks for that. Thank you so much for being on the show. And really, uh, one of the most creative people I've ever met and I'm inspired by creativity. So really grateful to have had the conversation with you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure being on. You bet. Well, we'll do it again as well as we can next time, everybody. Until then, stay safe. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and recommend it on iTunes, Outcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more information on this show and Rob at Jollis.com. <laughs>